Well, hi, I'm Nancy. I'm a Miles for Hips board member. This is Team Week 2024. And I'm here with Chelsea, who is a nurse practitioner joining us in the United States. Thanks for joining us today, Chelsea. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So I thought we could start off. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in the topic of hip dysplasia? Sure. Yes, I live in North Carolina. Um, I have one daughter and a husband who's in law school. Um, I've been in pediatrics for as long as I can remember. Um, I started out as a pediatric nurse inpatient. Then I moved into pediatrics in the outpatient and clinic world. And then while I was doing um, the outpatient clinics, I started nurse practitioner school and graduated. Um, so now I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner in ENT or ears, nose, and throat. Um, and then I got interested in hip dysplasia. My training for being a nurse practitioner is in um, pediatric primary care. So um, we do a lot of screening, especially if the babies were born breech um, and checking those hips with all of the well child checks. So that's when I first kind of encountered um, hip dysplasia. And now I'm a hip dysplasia patient myself. Can you tell me, um, I'm not sure all of our viewers will know the difference between a nurse and nurse practitioner and tell us a little bit about what that means and what is, what's the difference between the two? Sure. So um, as a nurse, you are trained um, to be um, either as a bedside nurse or in nursing homes and schools. There's lots of different locations where you can be a nurse. Um, to be a registered nurse, it means that you've gone through at least a two-year um, program. And then if you are an RN BSN, that means you have your bachelor's of science in nursing. So that's a four-year undergrad degree. Um, and then when you're a nurse practitioner, that means that you've gone on to graduate school and you have your master's of science in nursing. And that's another, depending on what program you do, another two to three years for that degree. And you can um, prescribe, you can diagnose, um, there's lots of, of different settings for nurse practitioners too. They're very similar to physician's assistants. And I'm sure with your professional experiences and now your personal experience in this, you've seen many different roles. Um, but what roles have you seen nurse practitioners playing on the hip dysplasia care team? Or do you are you aware of them playing on these teams? Yes, absolutely. I see NPs and PAs that are um, helping treat patients um, either with first diagnosing them and then sending them to the surgeon or seeing them post-operatively um, and helping manage pain. Um, and I also see NPs and PAs in the hospital as well that are helping do rounds after your surgeries. What do you feel, um, and now you can speak from a couple different realms of this, but what opportunities do you feel there are for patients to be partnering with nurses and other members of the healthcare team throughout the throughout the care journey, I guess I should say? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So nurses are big on education and making sure that patients understand what to expect, um, what their caregivers should plan for and expect as well. And then nurses are also the ones that... Um, carry out the orders of the nurse practitioners or providers. Um, so we're the ones usually, you know, giving the medication or giving the shots, um, <laughs> helping keep the patient as comfortable as possible, both in the inpatient world and outpatient. Um, and just being kind of that messenger um, and usually the person that's answering the triage phone calls. Um, so it really has a big part of care. Do you, and now, you know, you've have experience now being on the patient care side as well. I know your coming, your surgery is coming up. So your experience right now is on the preoperative side, but um, can you share a little bit about what that experience is like, especially knowing this world from both sides, both as kind of what it's like to work on the healthcare provider side, but also as a patient? Yeah, definitely. So it's kind of funny because growing up, I always had some weird things going on with my the left side of my body, which is the side that has the hip dysplasia, but no one ever really 
kind of went down that avenue to figure out what was going on. So like I had sciatica and I was like 13 years old. They're like, hmm, that's weird that a 13 year old has sciatica, but we kind of just let it be. And then when I was training for a marathon, I had a lot of IT band issues, but we kind of just thought it was the IT band. And now looking back, um, now that I've been diagnosed with hip dysplasia, I'm like, well, wow, this all makes sense. Um, so I am preparing for my, a PAO and labral repair. And, um, about two years ago is when a lot of this hip pain started. And I saw one surgeon and they didn't mention anything about a PAO or hip dysplasia. It was mostly about the, um, torn labrum and that PT will help and try to PT my way out of surgery. So I had been going through PT for a year and a half or so, and it helped you know, definitely give me some more strength and range of motion, but I just wasn't where I wanted to be um, because I'd love to be back running and um, riding a bike, even just like playing on the playground with my daughter has been hard. And so um, as a patient, you are absolutely, you know, more than able to get a second or even third opinion if you need to. And I just felt like maybe I needed to see somebody else. And as a provider, I definitely want people to know that like, I'm just one opinion. And so you are able to get these other opinions and figure out what's best for you and be an advocate for yourself. Or if it's for your child, be an advocate for them, because I'd much rather you get the care that you need than just settle for what one person says. So I'm very glad that I went to another surgeon and they diagnosed me with hip dysplasia and said, you know, to be honest, we can fix the labrum, but it's not going to fix the underlying problem. And so that's how I learned all about this. Um, and just a, again, as a provider, like I don't be afraid to ask questions and ask them multiple times if you need to, because it's a big deal to go through surgery and you want to be sure that you're making the right decision for yourself and for your family. Um, we'd much rather you ask the questions than just be left wondering. No, I think that's great. And and you've certainly experienced something that is not uncommon for many adult, adolescent and adult patients with hip dysplasia is that, you know, it's not uncommon to have kind of a diagnostic journey where with misdiagnosis along the way or incomplete diagnosis all, along the way. And, you know, I think your your point on learning to become a patient advocate is something that we really try to support patients at. You know, it's really important for patients to be able to be active members of their healthcare team and empowering patients to do that and also helping patients to understand the limitations of, of healthcare systems and what the options are and how to ask the right questions and how to describe their symptoms and, um, and also to get all the information that they need to make these decisions. And that can be, that can be really hard. Um, and I think that's also going to be such a great role, like you said, of the nurse, because sometimes these clinic visits can be very fast and very busy. And, you know, you're trying to prioritize the information needs. And I know for me personally, when I've been going through my journey, I've had a lot of interactions with the nurse and the nurse practitioners. Um, a lot of times they're the ones responding to the emails and, and trying to answer that and usually are wonderful resources. Yes. And that reminds me. Yeah. It reminds me of another point. And that's, yeah. I don't know how many patients in orthopedic and P or PAC, but for EN and ENT, I see 20 or more patients a day. And yeah. so we try to give as much time for each patient as possible, but also you have to keep moving. So you don't get like hours and hours behind. So yeah. Um, we, you know, if we miss something or didn't go over something as much as you would like, a lot of, um, healthcare systems now have the, my chart messaging mm -hmm. or some kind of portal that you can send a message after the fact, if you think of a question. And I think sometimes, at least in pediatrics, parents are like, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to be like that parent, but feel free to ask as many questions as you need, because that's why that portal is there. We don't always have enough time during clinic appointments to get to every question or every point that we need. Mm -hmm. So we have these other means of communication and we should absolutely use them. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the patient or the family, I mean, it's, 
it's either the patient, it's their body, or as a family, it's your child going through these experiences. And it's important that you feel confident moving forward and you feel like you have the information to do that. Absolutely. So you might've actually answered my last question, but I'll throw it out there anyway, just in case, you know, the wording triggers a different response, but you know, based on your experiences, both as a healthcare provider and as a patient, what advice would you have for hip dysplasia patients or families navigating their personal health care journeys? And I know we well, spoke a lot about the advocacy and asking the questions and not being afraid yeah. to reach out to the teams and over communicating at your needs. As, yes, as definitely. Um, I would just say that everybody's journey is different. Every patient is different. And um, each person, even like on Facebook, how we met, um, you know, that everybody has their own opinion and, and how you should go about things, but really just follow what's right for you and your body or your child. Um, and don't be afraid to, you know, seek care wherever you may need it. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's a really important point for people to know. Cause I know we are you know, obviously a lot of people watching these interviews are going to find us through social media and these can be incredibly valuable sources for social support and informational needs, um, especially related to, I think, like the logistics around surgery, but also recognizing that, you know, like you said, every patient is unique and, you know, really helping to empower patients to work as you know, recognize that they are a member of that healthcare team themselves and working with their providers to figure out what that right, right plan is that feels right to them. And that makes sense based on all the information they're gathering from their, their care team about their personal situation. Um, and being able to ask those questions and, and get the answers they need to, to move forward comfortably, you know, feeling as confident as you can with any of this, right? Right. <laughs> Perfect. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share or? I would just like to say it's nice to meet everyone virtually and good luck on all of your healthcare journeys. And I hope that if you are going through a post-op period or going to have a surgery soon, that everything goes very well and as smoothly as possible. And I'm super glad that there's resources like you guys for us to um, look into. Well, thank you. And Chelsea, it was wonderful having you join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>